Hey, Dream Chasers, this is Amy J, and thank you so much for tuning in to episode 242 of Chasing Dreams. Guys, as your personal hype man and friend, I am here to bring you some amazing women for Women's History Month. The first one is Holly Sharp. She's the author of Dream It and Do It. This is a book that when I first started this podcast, I thought to myself, there needs to be a resource, an encyclopedia, or some kind of guide for people to understand that there are more options to what you can do with your life than just what you are seeing in your life, right? Oftentimes we only hear about certain professions and certain things like uh, doctor, lawyer, engineer, policeman, firefighter, right? That's, that's all we kind of he- heard over and over. But this book is an answer to that wish I had. And I'm so excited to tell you and um, talk to Holly about this. And you're going to enjoy the talk. And now here's Holly. Hello, I'm Holly Sharp. I'm a children's book author who helps kids discover interests and potential career paths in hope of creating a generation of happier adults. And you are listening to Chasing Dreams with Amy J. Hey, Holly, thank you so much for coming on to the show. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. So you came across because of a book you've written, and I'm very excited to talk about this book and what it means. So I think it's um, it's kind of like a must read for young dream chasers and maybe even older dream chasers. But before we can talk about what you're doing for them, I want to talk about what young Holly wanted to be when she was a dream chaser in her teens. I wanted to be an advertising executive. Um, My mom used to say that when I was young, she would put me in front of Sesame Street and I would play and pay no attention. And then the moment that ads would come on TV, I'd pop up and watch the screen intently. And then as soon as the commercials were over, I'd go back to play. So I spent most of my life, including um, when I studied in undergraduate as uh, focused on advertising. So um, I really like love storytelling and I really thought that, you know, advertising was the coolest way to tell stories. So <laughs> that's what I wanted to be. That's interesting. I think you're the first person to tell me that you've, you're, you were more interested in the commercials than the <laughs> actual show. Yeah, and there's this children's board game called Advertising Junior. My mom bought it for me when I was in junior high school. It was my favorite game. And I would mem- like, I don't even know how I played it so many times because the whole point is that you're supposed to guess the taglines to things. <laughs> so like once you've played it and you know all the taglines, and I would play it all the time and win every time. Are you hustling people? Be honest. <laughs> Definitely hustling people. You were hustling people. From an early age, you had that marketing in you. I, I did. <laughs> so when you went from knowing that you were kind of into advertising and commercials and things like that, you kind of followed that path. Did you end up working in marketing, advertising agency or anything similar to that? So I spent a summer working at um, Ogilvy and Mather in, um, as an uh, advertising intern. And I absolutely loved it, but it was the summer of 2003 and no one was hiring. They actually made me an offer and had to take it back. And so I was unemployed for a couple of months after I graduated. In fact, I remember my aunt gave me a roll of quarters to do laundry with and I saved them all up to like go get a beer tower with my friends. (laughs) Like I was so (laughs) poor. (laughs) But um, anyways, I ended up finding a job in a marketing related field, but I never actually went back to do advertising specifically. And um, my marketing career actually led me to a career in product development. So I've launched a number of different products. Um, There's an ice cream product out there right now that uh, was mine. I've developed bug killing products. I've developed cleaning products. Um, So it was really, I think the product developer in me that saw a need for this book and decided to take my product launching skills and do something for myself instead of for a company. That's interesting. Now that's a pivot of sorts. And so how long were you doing product development? For the last 15 years. And and I hope, and it sounds like, I don't want to assume that you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it very much. Yes. Um, Frankly, like I never really meant to become a children's book author, just a lot of circumstances 
put me in the right place in the right time. Um, but now that I am one, I do wish that I could talk to teenage Hallie and say, listen, there's this great career that you can be your own boss and you can write where you want and when you want. Um, so I wish I had known then what I know now, but at least I got here. <laughs> you did. And let's talk about that a little bit because, you know, it's, it's not necessarily, uh, an anticipated or obvious leap to go from marketing and advertising to product development to a children's book, right? So yeah. there's the topic of the book and there's also the fact that you're writing a children's book. Right. You know? So before we get to the topic of the book, uh, this is a whole new area. I mean, it, it's not, right? We talked about it's not marketing, is not product design. What were your thoughts around jumping into this new area? I was really blessed with parents who installed a really strong self-esteem and can do in me. Um, so I don't think I ever really, I was mostly nervous. I don't, well, I guess I'll finish that sentence. I never really doubted that I could do it. Mm -hmm. um, what I probably doubted more was if it would be any good. Um, being a, a first time, <laughs> a first time author, um, I am one of the worst spellers on the planet. And even when I told my mom I was doing this, she was like, you better hire three editors. Because <laughs> I just, I'm so bad at spelling. I was part of the like hooked on phonics generation and it did not work for me. <laughs> so um, a shout out to my editor who is absolutely fabulous. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I think that I always, like my parents really did such a fantastic job in making me believe growing up that, you know, you can do the things that you put your mind to. And I, I give them a lot of credit for, um, you know, kind of making me the person that believes that if you start something, you can finish it. That's, that's awesome because that, that's a tough trait to have. And not everybody, not everybody is raised with that, unfortunately. And so you, I guess with that, you were like, hey, I could conquer this if I try it. It just may not be the high quality that you see on bookshelves. Is that kind of it? But you didn't let that stop you. Why not? <laughs> I mean, honestly, because I just wanted this book to exist so much. Oh. Um, it, was, it was really like in my heart and in my mind, and I felt like it needed to exist for my daughter. And my husband and I both agreed that if the worst thing that happens is that I have this wonderful book to give to my daughter one day, then it would be six months well spent and a, a really great outlet for a lot of energy that I had during the quarantine. And turns out it actually is a good book, so yay. But um, I think really I just wanted the book to exist so badly. And, and so let's talk about the book because um, it's phenomenal, right? I mean, as someone who is all about encouraging people to chase their dreams, uh, as a hype man for, for others, I, I think it's phenomenal what you've done with it. It's guys, it's uh, the link is in the show notes in the description, check that out. But it's called Dream It and Do It, 100 Possibilities, Stories, Real Life Role Models for Girls and Boys. So you've made this book 100. A hundred. Yes. A hundred. Yeah, I said that so many times while I was writing it. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm sure. Like, you're at number 37. Yeah. How many more to go? Like, and, and guys, this is, these yes. are amazing topics. So I just want to, I'm going to read a few of them. You guys got to get the book to, to see all of it and the people that she uses. But it's like, 100 Possibilities, Designing Photographs, Helping Your Community. Uh, performing on YouTube, right? So YouTubers, check that out. Um, editing the design of a movie, helping people with mind health. That, that's what I love to do. Um, developing medical inventions. How did you come up? Let's talk about this whole process. Sure. Let's talk about from the beginning. One, why this topic? So I chose this topic because I went looking for this book and couldn't find it. Like it's the entrepreneur 101 story, right? Where, you know, you go looking for something, it's not there. And I found myself in a position in life where I was being quarantined and recently unemployed and why not write a book? Mm -hmm. um, so when my daughter was, or I was eight months pregnant, I was looking for books for my daughter to put on our registry. 
Um, it's this new thing that people do where instead of bringing a card to a baby shower, you bring a book and you sign the inside of it. So I was like, oh, I'm going to put a bunch of books on my registry. And I absolutely love, love the Rebel Girl series. I was one of their first backers on Kickstarter. I own every single one of their books as an adult. I absolutely love them. And so I was like, you know, there must be something out there that's like Rebel Girls, but teaches kids about different career options. Does not exist. It doesn't. You can find books that are single careers, like, um, like Iggy Peck Architect, or um, in fact, on Amazon, the top 100 career books for kids, 10 to like at a ratio of 10 to one are firemen and vets. Mm. And they only cover 10 different careers total. So there's these careers that kids keep being told about yeah. over and over and over and over. But I mean, if you think about how many people go into business, how many children's books are about being CEOs? How many children's books are about being advertising executives, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I spent the basically the summer reading and researching a hundred different people and then writing like a crazy person to, to get it all done by Christmas. And, and, and it's amazing, guys, the details that she has in this book, uh, because you're talking about, you know, before the p pandemic, probably, and just people like dreams of helping during emergencies, uh, a man named Kevin Hazard, uh, Warren Buffett is in here. There's there's so many individuals and it's probably like uh, two, probably 10 pages. It's not even like a short. It's not like one paragraph. She's gone into detail about each of these guys and what they're doing and that topic that you've talked about. So we talked about why you're doing it. It's not available, which by the way, it was the perf was a quintessential product designers answer, right? It's not there. Therefore, let me create it. That's, that's typical engineer. Um, and then how did you come up with these ideas? So you took the summer to research and write, but before you could do that, where did, how did you come up with a hundred? Did you have 200 and cut it down and, or, or was it hundred and that's what it was? I always wanted to do a hundred and I think it kind of stemmed from my love of rebel girls. Um, and I always felt like that was such a great number because I bought that book for my niece when she was three years old and she's turning eight and we still read that book together. So it's so many stories, like you can go back and revisit them. It really, it's the only book I've ever seen start on the shelf of a kid so young and consistently stay as the other books start to turn over. But the way that I came up with the hundred people was to, um, I basically like made a list of everyone who has either written an autobiography, starred in a documentary or given a TED talk, everything I could find. And then I pared it down based on making sure that each career was different. I pared it down based on making sure that people were modern. So I really want, especially like technology changes so much that I really wanted the careers to be to people that you could go see today and learn about today. And then frankly, the biggest one was diversity. And I really did not want to write a book about a bunch of white men. No, no disrespect, like there's plenty of them in there. Um, but I really worked hard to make sure that all types of kids could see themselves in this book. And so that's really one of the things that I think um, helped shape how this book was developed in terms of who's in it and uh, what careers were featured. Yeah, you, you definitely beat me to the punch. I was gonna talk about that and, and how uh, this isn't your typical book guys, this is a book of that's inclusive. It's a wide range of people. Uh, there are pictures. Can we talk about the pictures? Did you draw this yourself? I so, wish I could take credit. I, I am actually um, a painter, but I am not, I'm not very good at, at people. So mm -hmm. I did end up hiring someone to help me with the illustrations. And, you know, for me, one of the things that was important is that I, I actually really wanted them to to be lifelike because I didn't want them to be seen as characters or as, you know, princess fairy tales. I really wanted them to, I wanted it to be illustrated versus using pictures because I wanted children to be attracted to the book, but I really did want them to be seen as real life role models and people that could be related to. Yeah, no success. Okay. So success, you, you were very successful in this because as I'm like looking at these pictures, I'm like, this is amazing. Like, where did she, like, um, 
where did she even come up with some of these people? Like they look so lifelike and but not even lifelike. You know what it looks like? It looks like a, a comic book panel of a real life person. I appreciate you saying that because actually that's kind of the direction that I gave my illustrator. So oh. yay. <laughs> Nailed it. You did. And, it, and it's awesome because it gives this lifelike kind of uh, immortalization of these people, which is a testament to them and a testament to you for choosing them and the, li the, like, the lifelike nature that you've put them. Like they look accurate. I, I don't know some of these people, so I can't say for all. <laughs> Warren Buffett looks like Warren Buffett. I like the way the way that Warren Buffett turned out to you. <laughs> <laughs> He's the one person I, I like in, in looking at it. It's like, yeah, that's Warren Buffett. Right. And so uh, phenomenal job with putting that together. And then you put this together, your, your blood, sweat and tears for six plus months. Did you self publish? I did self publish. Yep. So what was it like when you put this together and you, you hit publish? What is it like? When, you, when you're when you're waiting to see how it's received I kept picturing people from high school reading it and finding all of my grammatical errors like I don't <laughs> know why that was my big deep-seated fear is that I'd get an email from like my English high school teacher being like hey saw your book it's pretty good but I found about 10 grammatical errors um, and not having wanted to be an author I can't think of anything more intimidating on the planet than strangers reading the thoughts in your head where like, I love karaoke before I had my baby. Like I was a karaoke junkie. I love like performing. And if it were up to me, I'd go back and maybe be a Broadway star as well as an author. Um, but there is just something so very personal about the written word and when the first couple of reviews started rolling in and the first couple of awards, really like probably the only moment I've truly like cried since publishing was when I found out that I'd won my first award and it was a first place. And it was just someone who wasn't my mom telling me that I actually had done something good. Like that that's was a amazing. really big moment. That's, that's phenomenal. I think what you've done is, um, really put together a an amazing book and reference, I guess you could say, for people and for young people in particular to chase their dreams. Because I think oftentimes, and let's talk about this, because especially since you, it's one of the reasons you wrote it, you know, going through Amazon and seeing that there's like three topics that are put over and over. And I think sometimes we don't realize the possibilities that are out there unless they're presented to us. And oftentimes, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oftentimes we don't have that realization until we're writing pretty big checks to a university, right? That yeah. we should be spending our whole lives trying things and having interests and hobbies and using our, you know, 18 years of growing up as a jumping off point, not getting to university and going, oh, I like math. I guess I'll be an engineer, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's weird, you know, um, at one of my jobs at one point in life, I, I realized or found that there was a, there's so many things out there we just don't realize. Like there's an industry for, for name tags, for badges and stuff. Like there's an industry for labels. And I'm like, what? But, but it's true. Like there are so many things out there that we don't even realize because we're not exposed to it. We're not, uh, it's not presented to us. And so when it's out of sight, out of mind, it's not in our frame of reference for anything. Yeah. And then what do we do with that? Because we don't see that as a possibility. And so what you've done, I feel, is you opened up the world for children to say, hey, there are other things out there for you to do and be. And by mm -hmm. no means is it, is it a comprehensive list, but I think you kickstarted imaginations. And that's amazing. I'm... Honestly, the, the thing, my biggest goal with this book is that the next generation of kids are happier in their jobs than our generation. I looked at, when I was doing research for this book, I looked at a Gallup poll that was done in 2017. Two thirds of Americans regret their college choice and two thirds of Americans are not happy with their career choices. That's so much wasted, like college money, mental health, like it's insane 
that more of us are unhappy when it comes to what we chose to study or do than are happy. In fact, like that's why podcasts like this exist because people realize later in life they have this alternative reality or dream that they didn't have when they were younger. And so my hope is that, you know, I can inspire the next generation of kids to figure out earlier what things they're interested in as a jumping point into their careers. And research actually shows that kids who have hobbies make happier adults for all of those reasons. So I really, really, really hope that this book makes a difference in that way. Well, I think what, what it's doing is it's creating uh, possibilities and it's also showing them, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. Cause I think the other statistic I know of is that like uh, two thirds of Americans and it might not even just be just Americans, but two thirds of people who go to college don't, don't follow up with their major. Right. Yeah. I'm into that. I'm, I'm part of that statistic, frankly. So yeah. I, I don't think my degree was wasted. I learned a lot in college and use it in different ways. So, you know, for me, it's like, yeah, but you do all this other stuff, Amy, with your college education. So it's there. But I mean, the fact that a lot of people aren't happy with what they've done is, is a totally different thing. And I think it's great because of what you're doing, because um, you don't realize the things that you could be. You're normalizing that. That's that's the thing. I hope you under, you realize the power of what you've done is help to normalize choices that people didn't have before. Well, and if you think about like kids only know what we share that with them, right? So mm -hmm. they see what their parents do. So my husband and I are both business people. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, without this, she's exposed to us on a daily basis and is more likely to go into business than say into the arts or into the, a service industry, right? So I think that, it, you know, when kids see teachers and things on TV and, you know, what gets put into children's books. I mean, that's their reality. And so I do hope that this enters into places where kids have the opportunity to think outside of what they might normally do. In fact, I had on Instagram a few weeks ago, um, a family posted a picture with my book and the little boy had gotten out his Play-Doh and told his mom, look, like, I can be a landscape architect. Like, nice. What kids says that? Do you know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. I don't feel like in the, the people in their, when they're young are thinking of landscape architect, right? So like, that was such a wonderful moment to go. Yes. Yes. This is exactly what I wanted. That's, that's fantastic because, you know, in, in my day, which I think is funny to say, but it, back in my day, the options were doctor, lawyer, engineer, nurse, teacher, uh, policeman, firefighter. It was it was a handful of things, right? Today, I think for kids, it's still those same handful of things, but add on TikTok and YouTuber, right? Okay. That's probably the newest change since then. But what you've done is been like, hey, guys, here is all of the things that you could be. And it's not even a complete list. You could be anything, but we're just saying it doesn't have to be this set of things that you're exposed to all the time. Right. Right. And that's amazing. And one of the things that I tried to do too was take the careers that are more traditional mm -hmm. and really explain to kids what makes them either challenging or special or like really call something out. So for example, how many little girls do you know that want to be ballerinas? Yeah. Well, of the hundred stories, I bet that the ballerina I wrote about worked harder than anyone else in my book. Like it's crazy mm -hmm. how hard it is to actually be a professional ballerina. So I included being a ballerina, not because it's, an, you know, go be a ballerina everyone, but because I wanted kids to see that this is a career that's often front of mind, but it's really, really hard work. And most of the time to be a ballerina, by the time you've read my book, you better start taking lessons because it's, you know, two decades of experience before you're dancing professionally. Right. So, um, I, you know, still included all of those same careers that you just mentioned, but I really tried to put a T uh, like, a, um, I put in, <coughs> excuse me, Sal Khan, who started Khan Academy, mm -hmm. um, and talked about him as being a teacher, but like 
he's tomorrow's teacher, right? Putting free education online. So I really tried to add a twist to some of these more traditional careers that are still viable and fabulous, um, but really tried to maybe tell that story in a different way. Yeah, and that's that's the thing is we don't know, right? We see these magical beings doing different things in movies and shows and we're like, oh, I'll do that. But you kind of give a little um, background on what it takes to be that person, be that job, be that ballerina, right? And so that's that's awesome because I don't think sometimes kids or you no, know, even parents, we don't know the different things that these kids could do. And so I think it's a testament for parents to read this and say, hey, there are a lot more options than when I was around that we should probably expose our child to so that they have the option to, you know, choose what they want to do. Because oftentimes we're we're victim to the knowledge we have right and and so it's helpful to kind of see that it doesn't have to be limited well i think kids respond um better to examples than being told so our system is built today where your senior year you go to a guidance counselor who sees hundreds of kids you, you have a conversation about what you like and don't like and then she throws out some ideas or like, oh, you know, if you're good at this, why about, what about this? And so I think kids actually seeing real people doing things is a great way for, um, you know, interest to spark. And I tried to write it in a voice that parents would enjoy reading it with their kids mm -hmm. and give them a platform to have those conversations. Because it's not a hard conversation, but it's, you know, we tend to ask kids in our lives, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because it's fun to hear their answer. But I, that's really where it stops. I feel like there's not that next level of conversation where parents are really digging in and think, oh, you know, did you realize like, my niece wants to be an airplaner um, and, <laughs> and fly a plane? And like actually having that next conversation of like, do you realize that means being away from your family? more often than other jobs? Or, you know, do you realize it means that you have to really be into, you know, get into math and study hard in your maths? So um, I hope that this gives parents the opportunity to have that next level conversation about what certain things take, because I mean, I think I'm a great example of, I started talking like about being in advertising before I even really understood what it was. Mm -hmm. And it just stuck with me and no one explained the fact that like, when I graduated from undergrad, I qualified for welfare based on the salaries that advertise like entry level advertising people make. Like it's crazy, but I didn't know that my parents are not in the business world. They didn't know that. And it was really disheartening to find out after four years of studying that I wasn't actually going to make the type of money it requires to pay back a college education. So um, I have, and I grew up with parents who also did one thing with their life. My mom's a dental hygienist and um, she would kill to be a photographer. My dad works in insurance and he loves building homes. He built one of the houses we lived in. And I think watching too, the both of them have this dream that became you know, a hobby versus something they would have liked to do for a living. It just left me with this sense for my daughter that like, I really want her to understand all of the different possibility the world holds and that my role as her mom is to give her the tools to develop and harness hobbies and skills so that when she's an adult, she can lean into those instead of finding them when she's 40. Well, so this is the other thing that your book does. I think for the longest time, and this is a misconception, I think, that people like you and me and others are helping to, to unwind and untwist and correct, is that your job in life is to get a job, to make money, and have a roof over your head. And that's, that's life. That's what life is. That's the purpose. What do you mean, do something for fun? No. Is that going to bring you stability? Is that going to bring you money? When the truth of the matter is a lot of the people who are enjoying their life are the ones who are doing something they're passionate about. And then the money comes, right? And all these people with um, the employers are the ones who have figured that out and are the ones hiring the people who don't realize it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really, and I do think that because 
our generation falls into that a bit where, you know, here are the six things you can go do Mm -hmm. that we're more likely to raise our kids to have a book like this and to actually go through the motions of dreaming. I'm, I would love it if my daughter had 20 different dreams as she got older and we explored each and every one of them. But um, I can't wait to be having this conversation with her on a, on a very regular basis. And um, honest, I hope that this inspires other families to talk about what their dreams are as well, because it's, it's really interesting how this isn't something that is talked about every day all the time. It, it really is a simple question to get asked and answered. And then I think that's where it ends. You know, what's, what's interesting about what you've done is um, this isn't a book only for kids. And so I want to, want to tell you guys who are listening that very clearly right now, this is a book of possibilities for all ages. And the reason I want to say that is some of y'all who are listening to this are unhappy with what you're doing. And the things that Holly shares isn't just nine to five jobs. Like you don't have to be unhappy 24 seven, find something you enjoy, try some of this stuff out that she talks about. She gives you the answers on how to do it, at least to start, you kickstart your research to figure it out because, and, and I don't know if some of you listening need this, but pivot, you have permission to pivot. You know, Holly's giving you a tool book to kind of do just that. I have to tell you, like, even just writing this, it made me want to go back and like do 100 different jobs. Yeah. There, I write in there about being a voice actor. And I spent uh, a year in college being a um, on-air personality for a radio station. Mm-hmm. I happened to like be the one female intern and they needed a little better representation. So they gave me a microphone and um how cool would that have been? I mean, that's someone's job to, and and it's funny when it was one of the first things that uh, my nieces read about when I gave them the book and we were watching cartoons the next day. And one of them turned to me and went, wait, so that's a voice actor. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes, 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 yes. But like, you don't know that. Like, how cool is that job? Yeah, that that's the best thing I think. And, and why I also, uh, wanted you to come on and talk about your research and the process that you went through to put this out there because it's so important that people realize that and and take care of it. So Holly, before I let you go, we got to go into the important segment. So hang tight. Let's go. It's time to be intentional. It's time. So we got to break it down for these guys listening. What is one mistake you think across the board or a majority of dream chasers make as they chase their dream, a mistake that's kind of holding them back. I think one of the things that's paralyzing is that we, t- people love lists, right? Yeah. We love checking them off. We love mm-hmm. having them, even making them feels like we've taken a first step. And I think some of the things that can be debilitating is the list itself. Like if I'd have really thought too hard about, what it takes to self-publish a book that has any chance of being successful. I'm not sure with a new baby in my arms, I would have done it, but I had just enough energy to take what I knew to be the next step. And every day I would wake up and just think about one thing that I could do that day to move the pebble forward. Yeah. Whether it was, you know, start one new book, do one, get the website set up. I, the day, the night before I went in for my C-section is when my website went live. Oh, it's, like, <laughs> Every day, I would just pick one simple thing and take that one next step and thought, you know what, if this never happens, at least I did, like, I got that much closer and that much closer. And I, I really do think that it's a mistake sometimes when you're chasing a dream, because this isn't a, dreams aren't work projects. Dreams aren't this thing that if you don't get done by a certain day, your boss is going to fire you. Or like, I knew that if this book ended up taking me three years, then in three years, I would have done it, right? So the cool things about dreams is that you're not really on a strict timeline. And if today you're at 1% and tomorrow you're at two, well then, and this is frankly, having written a hundred stories, like, all right, now I'm at two. I am that much closer than I was yesterday. So um, I kind of answered it both ways, but I think if you are thinking about something that is, is in your heart and you want to go do resist the urge to make a massive checklist 
And it will, cause it will overwhelm you when you think about all of the to-dos, just ask yourself, what's the one thing I can get up tomorrow and do? And then the next day, ask yourself that same question over and over. <laughs> so you may have answered the next question, but let's, let's see. Uh, what is one thing that these dream chasers can do today to chase their dream? So I'll put, I'll add an extra layer to it. Okay. Um, one thing that I did that made this book happen in six months with an infant instead of three years is that I turned the TV off. Unless I was watching a documentary or something that was helping me. And if I did decide to, to watch television, I would either watch a non-serial TV show or a movie, but something where I would not. And even now, like it feels so guilty to me to, to watch a serial type yeah. Show. But it's incredible. Like if you think about your week and how much time you invest in TV, if you're sitting around with a dream in your heart and you are sitting in front of a television, like that is a, an hour that you could do that one thing that you thought of that morning to push yourself forward. So, um, you know, kind of adding what I think really helped was this commitment to turn off the TV and just go do this thing that I was so excited about. And frankly, like if it's a dream and you love it, it's probably better than TV anyways. Yeah, I, I'm going to co-sign on that because I found that in the last uh, six months or so when I've cut down on TV and replaced it with what I call dream chase sprints, there's little moments that I can work on my dream. Um, it moves the pedal, pebble forward to use your analogy. And yeah. it's been amazing. Well, this has been incredible. I feel so very inspired. I'm actually working on my next book right now. So like this really has me jazzed to like, don't be overwhelmed, like especially having just like finished this one. Yeah, no. Reminder to like one day at a time. No, no, Holly, you were amazing. I'm, I'm so grateful you came on the show. Looking forward to the second book. I'm sure it'll be just as helpful, inspirational and, and, and a resource to people. And can you give a hint on what the second topic is? I can. I found that when I was writing this book that the stories that kind of stood out to me were um, the young people in my book who really did exceptional things at a very young age. So my next book is not going to be 100. I, I think I'm going to go more to the 40, 50 range, but it will be all about people who did amazing things before their high school graduation. And I really want to show kids that as a follow up to this, that um, you know, one of the things I learned myself from this book is that you don't have to wait to be a grown up to chase your dreams. So that, you, you know, kids, you can get started tomorrow. You can write letters to congressmen. You can, uh, you know, start a campaign in your neighborhood. You can write your own neighborhood newspaper. Like there are things that you can do before you are even out of elementary school to make a difference or to start chasing this passion that you have. So my next book will hopefully really lean on the do it part. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And you got to let us know when it comes out so we can all check it out for sure. I really appreciate it. This has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Holly, how can these guys connect with you on the interwebs? Yep. So um, I would suggest people go to my Instagram, which is dream underscore and do it. There I have every Friday, I publish a free story out of my book with the illustration. So you can find examples of the stories there. It'll lead you to my website. Um, you can, I'd love if you drop a note, and interact with me. I've got some discounts posted. So come find me on Instagram and everything you need is there. That's fantastic. Guys, go check it out. Be sure if you missed that, it will be in the show notes in the description below. So check it out. Follow Holly. And, and get her book, because I think you guys will love what it says. And it's a resource for maybe not just you, maybe for the, put it on the coffee table so that somebody comes and they read it and be like, oh, who knew? Who knew? Great idea. I've never heard that one before. Thank you. It's, it's a good one, guys. Go ahead and do that. So, Holly, thank you again for being on the show. So appreciative. It's my pleasure. All right, folks, that was Holly Sharp. Didn't I tell you? Amazing what she's done what she's put together, and I am excited for her second book. I can't wait to, for you guys to see it. And I want you to understand and make sure you caught this. You guys could do anything with your life. It's never too late. It's never too late. It's important that you take some time to sit with yourself and figure out, are you happy with what's going on? And like Holly said, explore. It's never too late to pivot. Explore, all right? Figure out what it is you want to do. And use her book as a starting point. 
it can help you kickstart and figure out what it is you want to do or at least ex experiment. You don't have to have the right answers. Try, fail, learn, do again, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So I want to make sure you guys know and where you can find Holly's book. So be sure to check out the show notes over at amyj21.com slash episode 242. That's episode 242. All right, June Chasers, until next time, remember, don't stop, keep chasing.